Cool. All right, thanks very much for inviting me here. Um, so I'm going to offer a little bit of background and just sort of the, the different types of consequentialism that are that's sort of relevant here um, before I sort of focus in on a bit. Um, so maximizing, very familiar to everyone, of course, that act is right if and only if it is the very best of the available actions, produces at least as much value as any available alternative. Um, scalar consequentialists do away with all sort of Rightness, deontic talk altogether, just evaluate the acts on a continuous scale from the very best you could do all the way down to the very worst you could possibly do. And satisfies and consequentialists uh, aim for a more sort of moderate position which still talks about deontic notions, what you ought to do, what's permissible, what you think is obligatory. Um, but it holds that rather than, aiming, rather than requiring you to do the very best of all the possible actions, it says you just need to do what's good enough. So an act is right if and only if it's good enough, produces sufficient value. Um, and we sort of will, although we'll be focusing on the, the latter one, um, as we go through, I'll be talking a little bit about the relation to the other two views and how I actually end up um, kind of wanting to be able to suggest that they're not in as striking a tension as you might initially have thought. So it's sort of a way to reconcile, reconcile all three. Um, so I'm understanding satisfying here is sort of being motivated by worries to do with sort of demanding us. Um, so this is not the, the way that one always goes, um, so I'm, I'm particularly, if you're familiar with Sloat's work, I'm really not uh, following him here, um, but more, more concerned with the sort of idea that um, sometimes it just seems that asking someone to do the very best of the possible actions available just seems like it would be too much for morality to ask, um, and it seems intuitively permissible for them to just do something a little bit less than that, just do something that would be okay, that would be good enough, uh, rather than requiring the absolute best. Uh, so challenge then is for consequentialists to try to be able to accommodate uh, this more moderate, um, moderate sense um, of obligation uh, without sort of um, tripping themselves up too much. One thing I will mention is I'm not here too moved by a sort of standard demanding this worry to do with sort of the particular case of, you know, the idea that morality could ask a lot of us, uh, because I do think it just seems plausible independently that morality could ask a lot of us. Um, I think if you sort of look around at the world as it is in the state of today, it's sort of plausible that actually you know, maybe the way we live actually is quite unjustifiable. Um, that wouldn't seem to be that necessarily a mistaken conclusion. Um, so, that, so it's not that particular sort of verdict about our actual obligations that's moving me here. Um, so much as the thought, um, the more sort of structural worry that a maximizing consequentialist, for example, doesn't even leave any logical space between acting wrongly and acting perfectly. And it, it's that idea that there's not even logical space for anything in between it seems maybe a bit too strong. Um, okay, so, so this idea that we, we should really want a moral theory that leaves some room for super irrigation for the idea that um, there's what you're sort of required to do is sort of a level of sort of minimal decency, obliged to at least do this much. Um, but if you were to do even better than that, you, know, you might be going above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, so we shouldn't just identify um, what's minimally morally okay with moral perfection. Um, that's sort of why I'm a bit dissatisfied with uh, taking a maximizing approach to at least to all of the relevant kind of um, deontic notions. There seems to be a weaker notion that we should want to be able to accommodate. Um, so that's why I'm sort of interested in seeing whether a satisficing account uh, can, can be made to work to accommodate this slightly uh, looser or more relaxed sense of, sense of obligation. Um, you might think of it as being the one that's more tied to blameworthiness and so forth. Seem weird to necessarily blame someone for just being slightly less than perfect. Okay, so the general game plan for today is I'm going to start off by introducing and defending a, a different approach to satisficing than, than one normally finds. So I'll sort of explain what I think goes wrong with the standard approach to satisficing, and then how I think this um, sort of alternative approach that I recommend of kind of maximizing within demanding this moderating constraints, uh, how that works. The second step will then be to defend a distinctive sort of willpower-based account of demanding this, the sort of moral demands that I think um, our theory is wanting to sort of constrain uh, and protect agents from to some degree. We then combine these two elements um, to yield the new account of willpower satisfying consequentialism, the actual theory itself, and then wrap up by addressing um, what I think are the two sort of major objections that uh, might spring to mind as we go through the earlier sections. All right, so the first step, maximizing within constraints. All right, so the problem with standard approaches to satisfying is that they, well, they, 
The way they normally go is just by introducing a kind of a utility baseline. They say there's some level of value, some level of utility in, let's say, and what you're required to do is to bring about at least n value. Uh, and as long as you do that, you've acted rightly. If you brought about less than n value, then you've acted wrongly. That's kind of the standard sort of structure that satisfying views tend to take. Um, and it can sort of be further split down into um, whether the, um, the value n is determined in a way that's fixed and sort of absolute or whether it's proportional. Um, so you might have a view which said, well, maybe the relevant n is always like at least 50% of the value that you maximally could bring about, be the proportional sort, or it could go for an absolute level, like you have to bring about at least 100 hedons or something in every single action you do, and if that's not possible, the, the best you can do is 50, well, then you're, you have to maximize. Um, but if you have better options, it's okay to just bring about the 100 or whatever. All right, so the two worries that arise for that sort of standard approach to satisfying, and I think reasons why the view is not generally taken very seriously, um, one, there's a big worry about how to determine the baseline in any, in any kind of principled way. Uh, there's a worry that it's just going to be completely arbitrary how you pick the n, um, whether fixed or proportional, either way. The second worry is that the satisficer seems to permit the gratuitous prevention of goodness. Uh, so this is a nice objection due to Ben Bradley. So basically the, the setup is you imagine a case where even if you sit back and do nothing, things are going to be wonderful, way better than you have to make them be. And if that's just the default by your sitting back and doing nothing, but you act rightly as long as you know things end up being at least in, you can see where this is going, you can just get up and intervene and like randomly kick a few people, right? And just make things worse. But as long as the end result is still at least in, then you've acted rightly. And that seems absurd, especially given the sort of motivation for satisficing being that, well, you know, sometimes asking you to do the best is too much to ask, um, so we want to be a bit moderating there. But that's not any kind of reason to say that you can sometimes gratuitously make things worse than they would have been or gratuitously prevent things from being as good as they could be. Uh, you know, the gratuitous part of it is like, you know, you could have just sat back and done nothing. Why didn't you do that? Like, there's no, there's no reason to make things worse. Um, so that's really, that seems a really bad uh, problem. Okay. So I think the general sort of structure that I think a satisficer should take in order to avoid this problem is not, is to sort of do away with the utility baseline approach and say we're not, we're no longer just going to directly identify this value in um, which you then have to do at least that much good. We come at the problem from a slightly different angle and we say, you need to do the best you can, but without suffering undue burdens. And so if it would have been sort of too much, this is sort of getting at the idea of too much to us to do the very best, then there's an excuse for doing less, and that lesser amount will be the sort of the good enough. Um, but the core idea is that you're, you're not allowed to gratuitously make things go worse than they, are, than they could have if you could have just as easily, you know, just as cost-free um, made things better. So the sort of official statement of constraint of maximizing is to claim that an act is permissible if and only if it produces no less value than any alternative the action, uh, action the agent could perform that's either acceptably burdensome or comparably burdensome to the one they actually do. The six, so the first clause um, is sort of um, identifying the level of um, here's what could reasonably be asked of you. And you have to do, you have to bring about the best possible action that's, you know, uh, not more burdensome than that, at least. The second clause about comparably burdensome is to um, avoid the case where someone takes on more of a burden than they had to, but then just randomly kicks someone on the side. Uh, if, if we're going to say, you know, you could have taken on the burden without the random kicking people, but surely that's where, what you really should have done instead. Um, so that's why I've got both clauses there. But the overall gist of it is just this idea that you should do the best you can without suffering undue burdens. That's sort of the general structure that I'm going to be sort of working to flesh out uh, and see if we can do it in a plausible way. So a couple of questions that arise. First is a question of um, how do you settle the right amount of burdens to us? So again, that's the question that arose for the other form of satisficing too. Uh, and I'll be returning to this later because I do want to be able to give a kind of principled account, a principled way to actually determine this. Um, so we'll see whether you're, whether you're convinced by, by the eventual story given there. Before we get on to that, I first want to ask the question about how are we to understand the burdens uh, that are relevant in the first place? So you can kind of think of this as like the quantitative question, you know, how much burdens, you know, what's the number of, uh, uh, that would be too much to ask of someone? 
This is more qualitative. The question is, what are the kinds of things that actually are legitimate kind of burdens in the first place um, that we should be sort of wary of having morality putting too much of this kind of stuff onto us? So particularly the reason I ask this is that it seems to usually be assumed that the relevant kind of burdens are costs to your well-being. Uh, and particularly in thought experiments, this corresponds often to like a particular number of dollars coming out of your wallet or something like that. And that doesn't seem to me the relevant kind of cost, um, partly because it seems to me that as a consequentialist, you really shouldn't have any kind of objection to um, a sort of a Robin Hood type situation where someone just hacks into your bank account, takes a bunch of your savings and donates them to the third world. Uh, that doesn't seem objectionably demanding to have that cost imposed on you um, because the benefit's so much greater uh, to others. There seems something more distinctively burdensome about having the cost be um, one where you have to kind of voluntarily undertake. You're being asked to yourself choose to donate this large amount of money. That's sort of the hard thing to do. Um, so I'm going to try to suggest that the relevant kind of burden is more one to do with effort and how much uh, sort of effort it would take for you to do something rather than just the sort of standard notion of how costly it would be. Okay, so this is bringing us to the second stage, defending this distinctive account of, of moral demands, a willpower-based one. So I've got three, three sort of reasons um, I'm going to offer to try to motivate uh, the willpower-based account. One is just an appeal to intuitions. So here's the sort of um, contrast cases for you to think about. So what strikes me is the more difficult demand uh, were to imagine that you could save many lives in the third world by donating a certain portion of your savings to give well-recommended charities. The question is, are you required to donate the funds? Uh, just think about how, how, how demanding, think about how demanding it seems to be if that was a, if that was a real demand that was placed on you um, for any sort of fixed value of the portion of your savings. And compare that to how demanding the follower, following case seems to be. Easier demand. Let's suppose that while sleepwalking, you accidentally set up an automatic payment that will transfer the same amount, uh, the same portion of your savings to the Give Well Recommended Charities. Furthermore, let's suppose that this activity sort of seeps into your dreams, and so you have uh, a bit of a chance to get somewhat accustomed to your having done this, uh, sort of subconsciously. Uh, you get more used to the idea, and although you're surprised when you wake up to find that actually the, the dream was real and you really did set up this transfer, um, you're at least not quite as shocked as, as, um, as might otherwise be. It's not the sort of thing where, you know, previously part of the worry is you might just think this isn't the kind of thing that I do or that I've done before. Um, but if it sort of starts to get a bit normalized as like um, where imagining it seems more psychologically uh, congruent to the agent with their identity as they've gotten used to this idea, um, the thought is that'll help make it go, seem a little bit easier and less of a demand in the, in the psychological sense that I'm concerned about. Right, so that's the case I'm imagining. We ask the question again, are you required to refrain from cancelling the transfer? So you've still got time to cancel the transfer. Are you required to refrain? Now, I'm not suggesting any particular answer that's you know, no and yes or anything like that, but just asking you to think about the comparative sort of stringency, apparent stringency of the demands in either case. And so my suggestion is that uh, the demand in this case, if it was sort of demanded to refrain from cancelling the transfer, that seems like a less burdensome demand to me um, than the outright demand to actually go and set up the transfer in the first place. Um, it's my sort of name, easier and difficult demand. Okay, so the difficult demand seems more demanding to me in the relevant sense, uh, despite obviously equal material burdens in either case. It's the same portion of your savings that are going to be disappearing either way. And the difference seems to lie in the demands being placed on our agency or willpower. So the thought is, it just takes a lot more willpower to actually go out and start and set up this entirely new kind of action. Uh, if a lot of the work has already been done and you're just being asked not to cancel it, um, it's sort of it's it's less of a demand on the on the agent's agency uh, to just ask them to do nothing. Um, and so if you share my intuition that it seems less demanding in the relevant sense, and that's at least something to push you in the direction of thinking, maybe it is something to do with willpower and effort difficulty rather than just material costs. Um, that's really sort of relevant to, to this understanding of, of um, demanding this. Okay. Second case, um, and the second reason, it's the thought that there can be prudential demands, demands to do things that are actually 
good for your well-being, that improve your well-being, but that nonetheless burdensome in the same kind of way as moral demands are. Um, so I thought is that some outright beneficial to the agent actions or policies, such as exercising, vegan diet maybe, um, can be nonetheless experienced as demanding to the agent uh, if they require significant willpower to kind of overcome old bad habits. Um, so that just, that just sort of seems plausible to me. Um, so then the thought is, again, if we can have things that are demanding in the relevant sense, despite actually being good for you, not costly in, in terms of your welfare at all, um, then we need an alternative account of what it is that's contributing to the demandingness. And my proposal is it's the effort required. It's the effort rather than the cost. Uh, I mean, one can try to push back against it by saying, well, maybe there's at least sort of momentary harms to your well-being, like the exercising is unpleasant in the moment, even if it has long-term benefits. Um, we can talk about that in the Q&A, but I don't think that's sort of sufficient to fully account for the, for the demands, because it could be a pretty negligible cost um, that still be experienced as, as significantly demanding. All right. So that's the first two bits done. Now onto the actual resulting theory of what you get if you put all this together. So willpower satisfies in consequentialism claims that an act is permissible if and only if it produces no less utility than any alternative action the agent could perform with either of the following two properties. Um, firstly, no greater expenditure of, no greater expenditure of willpower um, than, um, than the action that you do perform, or secondly, um, up to X willpower, where again we've yet to settle uh, how to determine that X. But basically the idea is there'll be some effort ceiling x that's to be determined um, in a context-sensitive way. And the claim is you ought to do, you ought to um, perform whatever action would bring about the best consequences that you can without requiring you to exert more than x effort. So if the very best you can do requires no effort at all, you should do that. If the very best you can do requires more than x effort, but there's something reasonably good you can do with less than x effort, then you're required to at least do um, that sort of second best option. And it would be supererogatory to, to exert more effort than that um, to do the very best thing. Um, and again, this first clause is there to ensure that if you do exert more than X effort, but then you randomly pick people as well, well, that's wrong. Uh, you should do the, do the uh, best thing with uh, the, amount of, the amount of effort that you exert. Okay. And one thing to flag is that uh, this is not to encourage gratuitous expenditures of effort or willpower. I'm not saying that acts are right in proportion to the amount of effort you expend or anything like that. The only role of sort of effort and willpower in this is determining um, a kind of ceiling which more effort can't be demanded of you. But beyond that, what you should do is still just the best action within the more restricted um, range of options now. Um, so. Certainly, if you can do a better action with less effort, do the better action. Okay. So two virtues of the theory that are worth bringing out straight away. So the first is that it avoids Ben Bradley's worry really neatly, I think. Um, never condones the gratuitous prevention of goodness, because the thought being is that a gratuitous prevention is precisely one where like, you're going out of your way to make things worse. You're expending extra effort to prevent things from being better than they would have otherwise been. So if you could bring about a better outcome with less effort by sitting back and doing nothing, then that's sort of just ruled out like, really clearly um, by, the, by the theory, which requires you to do the very best that you can um, up to the level of effort that you've expended, at least. Okay, so it's that sort of case, it's never going to be condoning the prevention of goodness. It would always instead require at least that you sit back and do nothing if that's better. Maybe it will in some cases require you to actually do things that are yet better than sitting back and doing nothing. Second nice feature of this theory is that I think it's a really nice and natural account of supererogation as exceeding the effort ceiling, however we determine this X, which we're yet to come to, but exceeding that effort ceiling to achieve even better results than could have been done um, with less effort. You know, that kind of has a sense of, you know, there's a real kind of moral merit there to someone who's going above and beyond in their efforts to achieve even better results than they could have otherwise done. And this is in stark contrast, recall, to the standard kind of utility baseline approaches to satisficing, because the flip side of Bradley's objection is, of course, that someone who refrains from randomly kicking people or randomly making things worse, um, and so let the really great thing happen, 
have thereby acted in a supererogatory fashion just by sitting back and doing nothing, because uh, it would have been okay for them to intervene and make things worse. Um, and I think that's crazy, a crazy part of the standard view to say that it would be super it could be supererogatory just just sit back and do nothing. It's like it's not going above and beyond. Like if sitting back and doing nothing is is like a good thing to do, then that's just should be what's required. It's not not supererogatory. So I think this is a, a nicer account. Um, all right. So the two challenges that that might have sprung to mind already. So obviously there's the question about how do we determine if it's ceiling X. Uh, the other thing that might have sprung to mind is dealing with the dastardly, people who find it incredibly difficult and would require a huge amount of willpower to behave in a minimally decent way. Are they going to, be get, are they going to get let off easily on this account? Uh, so that's the challenge I'm going to turn to shortly. So those are the two major challenges we're turning to. Before we do, I want to make a little bit of a detour. Um, Actually, it occurs to me that I, I didn't have a slide on the third reason for preferring, um, for preferring the uh, effort-based account. So feel free to come back to that in the, in the questions if you want the, the additional reason that I, I, I forgot to go over. All right. So a little interlude here on deontic pluralism, which I'm going to be talking about because it's going to kind of show how what's motivating part of my approach to satisficing is going to be an aspect of the theory that we can then use to help specify the effort ceiling in a principled way. Okay. So the general suggestion is that we can actually kind of reconcile the three forms of consequentialism, the scalar, maximizing, and satisficing, by thinking that there's just kind of a range of different senses of ought that are relevant to different questions, and these different theories give the correct answers to the corresponding uh, different senses of ought. So scalar consequentialists claim that there's no really no such thing as oughts, uh, no sense of right at all, and so I'm disagreeing with them there. But the one thing that I do think that they're plausible right, plausibly right about is that the weight of reasons for action is just a continuous scale. Um, it's a continuous scale from best to worst. Um, the strength of the reasons you have to perform an action are proportional to the amount of value produced by the action. Those sorts of claims seem plausible enough to me from a consequentialist perspective. Um, and there's no important discontinuities in terms of thinking like, so a contrasting view would be to hold that it's going to be more important to move someone from a barely impermissible to a barely permissible act. I uh, suppose you are required to give at least 10% of your income to charities. Getting someone to go from 9 to 10% rather than someone else going from 1 to 2 or from 21 to 22, um, I think really those should all be equally important, um, assuming that people will make the same uh, income so the percentages aren't a different amount, producing a different amount of goodness. But just the move from impermissible to permissible shouldn't be one that we actually think is that important in the sense of modifying the strength of reasons for actions in a, in a radically different way. Um, so I think the scalar consequentialist is right about that. And I think the maximizer is right about the ought of most reason. I think there's an important sense of ought that's sort of aspirational. It's talking about, well, here's what is kind of you ideally ought to do. You want the question to what the answer to the question, what is it that sort of ideally I, I morally ought to do? And um, then I think the um, the maximizer's account is, is plausibly right about that. Um, and moreover, I think that's plausibly the property that really should be guiding our action, that it would sort of be a, a, a kind of a moral mistake to <laughs> be aiming to act in a merely sort of minimally decent way or to do the like the bare minimum that's okay. Um, I think that would be sort of excessively morally complacent. So I think um, in a sense that this more aspirational ought is, is maybe more a more practically relevant one is sort of what we really should be aspiring to. Um, nonetheless, I do think that there remains a further more minimal, uh, more relaxed kind of ought, this ought of minimal decency, um, tied with notions of being sort of normal blamelessness, um, which is tied to considerations of when the reactive attitudes of blame and guilt and so forth would normally be warranted. Um, and so it's this alternative and uh, sort of weaker uh, sense of ought that I think the satisficing theorist is really trying to address and to give an answer to, to the question of what ought I to do in this more minimal sense? What is it that is at least morally okay, even if it's not morally ideal? Okay. So this tie into the reactive attitudes and when blame is warranted is going to be important for what comes next. So let's turn to the question of how do we determine the effort ceiling x. We're going to say you have to do the best that you can with up to x effort. 
how much effort can reasonably be demanded of agents? So recall the relevant sense of permissibility that the satisficer is addressing is one that's closely tied to uh, blameworthiness and blamelessness. And I take it one plausible kind of approach to thinking about um, blame and when it's warranted as a kind of quality of will account. So the thought there is that people are blameworthy insofar as they act in a way that demonstrates an insufficient concern for others. Uh, and you're blameless if you um, show, act in a way that demonstrates adequate concern. Um, as a general rule. Okay, so that then suggests a natural way, I think, of sort of trying to kind of bootstrap up a, a, an effort ceiling X for our moral theory out of this um, account of the reactive attitudes that we can appeal to. So the thought is that the effort ceiling X is going to be that degree of moral effort which is required for an agent at a time, this can vary for different agents in different times, but it's whatever uh, amount is re uh, required for an agent at a time to act with adequate moral concern. So I'm going to spell this out a bit, because it's kind of a key part of the paper. So let's think about how consequentialists in particular should be thinking about what moral concern amounts to and sort of being adequately concerned about others. So I think we're going to want to understand moral concern as being properly directed at kind of impartial promotion of the good, the welfare of sentient beings, um, without any intrinsic concern for deontological constraints. That's what a consequentialist is going to think moral concern amounts to, right? And then if you think about how it is that we typically fall short of those things, I think there's sort of two, um, two particular kind of failings that, that maybe spring to mind as being most salient here. One is obviously just having kind of biased values. You know, none of us are perfectly impartial. Uh, we favor ourselves, we favor local interests, our loved ones, and so forth. Um, and the impartial consequentialist will think that's kind of a moral mistake, a bias that we have. Um, but it explains why we commonly uh, <coughs> fall short of the, of the consequentialist ideal. Um, the second, which is maybe less discussed, but I think might be at least as important, is just sort of sheer instrumental irrationality um, as it comes to things like weakness of will, the sheer force of habit. Um, so when I think about why I'm not as thoroughly a vegetarian as I think I probably ought to be, it's just that old habits are hard, you know, old habits die hard, hard to overcome. Um, nonetheless, I think either of these kinds of um, moral flaws or lacks could in principle be overcome by a sufficient exertion of willpower, is the thought. Um, if you sort of imagine an agent who has, who is given the true moral beliefs, um, but they have these biased desires, or they have this weakness of will. The thought is, in either case, there's a question about, well, how much willpower would it take for them to act on the true moral beliefs once they're given them, um, despite these sort of other failings of um, either motivation or um, instrumental rationality. And so it's just a question of how much willpower would it take for such an agent to be able to act with full, uh, edit, well, what's going to be counted as adequate moral concern. Um, and then the thought is that we just plug that value in uh, into the willpower satisfying consequentialism formula. Okay. So just to step back a bit, we're looking at a quality of will account. And the quality of will account is telling us about when blame and certain reactive attitudes are warranted. And the story is that you're going to be warranted in feeling blame and resentment towards someone if they act in a way that demonstrates an inadequate level of moral concern. What is the level that's adequate or inadequate? Um, well, in a sense, I'm not giving, I'm sort of fobbing off that difficult question down the road a little bit. And I'm saying, well, we don't need our theory of sort of reasons for action and right action to answer that directly. We can instead appeal to whatever the sort of theorists of the, whatever the quality of will theorists identify as being an adequate level um, of, um, of concern. But we're just, going to be under, we're just going to understand it as being sort of fleshed out in a distinctively consequentialist way, as being tied to uh, correcting for these um, sort of mistakes. And so we ask how much willpower is required to correct for those mistakes uh, to get up to the, whatever has been identified as the adequate level. And then it's that... Uh, that amount of willpower is the value that I'm then appealing to in my theory. So hopefully it's sort of reasonably clear how, that, how the structure of that is working. Okay. Some happy consequences 
from going this route. So the first is that more willpower can be required of the naturally less altruistic to bring them up to an adequate level of moral concern. So imagine the, the sort of the dastardly person just, just finds it so difficult to refrain from verbally abusing anyone they see, right? And so you might have worried that my account would say, well, you know, maybe they end up acting rightly as long as, you know, they expend a whole lot of willpower and they manage to uh, not abuse the first person they see. And then they, they blow their top when they see the second person. But, you know, they worked so hard to refrain when it came to that first person. Um, does that mean they acted rightly in verbally abusing the second person instead of both? Um, and I don't want to say that. Um, but this account suggests that insofar as you're imagining someone with the sort of disposition to, who just so strongly wants to verbally abuse everyone they see, this is obviously someone who is drastically lacking in adequate moral concern. Um, we're imagining it's not just a neurological tick, but it's actually something that is sort of demonstrating a, a kind of an ill will. Um, that, that's sort of why it's, why it's impermissible and why it's blameworthy. All right, so then the thought is, it might just require a huge amount of willpower for them to get up to a level that would be minimally decent, because that's just how thoroughly indecent they are. And that's okay. I mean, on my account, if it, just, if it requires a huge amount of willpower for someone to act in a minimally decent way, then my theory is saying, well, that huge amount of willpower is what's going to be demanded of this agent, because they need to be willing to, they need to act in the best way that they can up to the amount of willpower which is such that in order to qualify as adequately concerned, you would be willing to expend that much willpower. You, you know, that's the willpower that would overcome your flaws and moral concern and so get you up to that required level to avoid blame. Um, so it's kind of a mouthful explaining that, but but hopefully you've sort of got the gist. Okay, so more willpower can be required to bring someone up to an adequate level of moral concern if they started off in a severely sort of lacking, um, a sort of point of, of lacking adequate concern. Second point that I think is kind of interesting, I haven't really thought that much about it or developed it, but insofar as you accept a kind of a general um, sort of methodology of reflective equilibrium, you might think that although I've presented this as sort of taking for granted an account of quality of will and then pulling that in and using that as a resource and then fleshing out this account of right action, um, you might think it could, in principle, sort of go both ways. So maybe we start off uh, doing that to sort of get our rough sense of what the, uh, what the right value of X should be. But then our considered judgments about uh, what actually the, the right moral verdicts are in various cases uh, in terms of permissibility. Um, these could in turn inform our theories of blameworthiness. Um, so it would be interesting if it could turn, sort of turn out uh, working, uh, informing both ways. And finally, consequentialists can join the conversation around less demanding conceptions of permissibility. Um, so I do think it is a real worry about the standard maximizing view, sort of much as I like it for the aspirational sense of ought, um, that it just doesn't seem to be talking about permissibility in the ordinary sense. Um, so, you know, if, sort of think about what people mean when they talk about you know, whether something is morally okay um, or not okay. They just don't have in mind the question of, is this morally perfect or <laughs> slightly less than perfect? I mean, there should be different questions. Uh, so I just don't think the maximizer is really even talking about this concept of morally okay. And the scalar consequentialist certainly isn't. Um, so I do think it's sort of important for the consequentialist <laughs> to have something to say about it. And so I think that the best the best hope we have for sort of joining this conversation is to uh, try to pull in resources from sort of quality of will and reactive attitudes um, and then giving it a distinctively consequentialist spin as I've tried to do. Um, we can then maybe say something a bit more useful about it. All right, so really tried to do three central things in this paper. So the first thing I'm trying to do is convince you that the best satisfying structure in general, is going to be one that steps away from the traditional kind of utility baseline structure and instead opts for some form of maximizing within demanding us moderating constraints. Okay, uh, that's the way you, that you avoid Ben Bradley's objection, and it's really important to do that. Second thought is that I really think all consequentialists should be on board with this deontic concept of permissibility that's derived from hypothetical blamelessness, hypothetical blameworthiness. Um, so 
I think even, even Alistair Norcross and those who are very suspicious of Daronta concepts in general, um, who wouldn't want to think that there was any sort of fundamental normative weight to be given to these Daronta uh, concepts, um, should nonetheless be okay with the thought that we can kind of construct a notion of permissibility, just like um, even the scalar consequentialist should think, well, we can surely talk about an ought of most reason and say, uh, identify the ideal thing, the very best action as being um, sort of what you have most reason to do and so what you ought to do in that sense. Um, and in a similar way, I think it should be fine um, with talking about uh, what you ought to do in a sense that's then tied to other attitudes besides those that consequentialists usually talk about, namely avoiding um, reactive attitudes. Um, and the distinctive reasons that sort of uh, ground those. So I'm hoping that I can sort of get on board a wide range of consequentialists in thinking that, you know, there is this further concept that we can talk about, um, and it doesn't commit us to any of the problematic kind of, like, thinking it's more important to make that increment from slightly impermissible to slightly permissible. You know, none of that is a commitment of this view. Um, so you can avoid the, the sort of worries that, that Norcross has uh, while still embracing this. And then finally, my claim that willpower satisfies and consequentialism is the correct account of what's permissible in this sense. Uh, more controversial claim, but we'll see if anyone's convinced. Right. Thanks very much. <laughs>